Okay, holding space for others as they rebuild their life is a skill set we need to develop. Bearing witness to pain is a gift we can give to one another. So I have a little poem when I was reading her bio, uh, it clicked with me and I was like, that, that matches. So let me read this little poem. It's on empathy. Let me hold the door for you. I may have never walked into your shoes, but I can see your souls are worn. Your strength is torn under the weight of a story I have never lived before. Let me hold the door for you. After all you have walked through, it is the least I can do for you. Written by Morgan Harper Nichols. So I have the honor to present Dr. Nancy Lopez from University of New Mexico. She's a professor of sociology at the University of New Mexico. She directs uh, and co-founded the Institute for the Study of Race, Social Justice at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Lopez scholarship, teaching and service is guided by the insight of intersectionality, the importance of examining race, gender, class, ethnicity together for integrating inequalities across a variety of social outcomes, including education, health, em employment, housing, and developing conceptualized solutions that advance social justice. She authored Hopeful Girls, Troubled Boys, Race and Gender Disparity in Urban Education, and co-edited Creating Alternative Discourses in the Education of Latinas and Latinos, Mapping Race, Critical Approaches to Health Disparities, Research, Quantcrit, and Anti-Racist Approach to Education Equity. Dr. Lopez is the first woman of color tenured in the sociology department and the first woman of the African diaspora tenured in the College of Arts and Sciences and promoted to full professor. Dr. Lopez is a black Latina, US born daughter of Dominican immigrants who never had the privilege of pursuing education beyond and second grade. Spanish is her first language. She participated in Head Start upward bound and graduated from a large urban de facto segregated public school, public high school in New York City. Um, me coming from a foreign country, <laughs> I already told you, like somebody asked me this question, where did I go to school? When I read these kind of things, it really surprises me. Believe me, it really surprised me from top, like, you know, bottom somewhere. I'm like, how's it possible? Because living in Pakistan, we always looked at America like, wow. But when I come here and see and live, and I'm like, there's a lot America needs to do. There's a lot. And being an American, I'm part of it. And I'm so proud of you that you're here. Thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Y saludos, familia. Un placer estar aquí. I wanted to correct two things that are my typos. I used to serve as VP for Equity and Inclusion, and I was I used to be a secretary treasurer, so sorry, I must have forgotten to delete that. So um, today, what I really want us to think about is none of us created colorism, anti-Blackness, settler colonialism, but we're all located in these systems of inequality. So how do we develop our intersectional lens, right? To create what my colega Ruth Sambrana calls equity lifts, right? So this is about getting us to do that deep reflection at the individual level, at the institutional level, at the historical, at the place level, at the structural level, so that we can create a more just community for everyone. So that's my goal today, right? I'm glad, and I'm sure you all did the land acknowledgement. I'm not gonna read it in the interest of time, but the idea is for us to think about what are we doing? How are we practicing this, right? It's important to read it, but what more needs to be done? This is also a draft of a labor acknowledgement of the sacrifices of African-Americans in our country. What does that mean for us to reflect on that? And beyond that, what are we going to do differently, right? Um, this is just a snapshot of some of those works that were mentioned. And in red, I highlight some of the ongoing research that I'm doing that I will tell you 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I've been at UNM for 22 years. I applied for many of these same grants, ones looking at the implementation of ethnic studies at the high school level. We know it reduces inequality. How do we look at that in a complicated way? Another one is looking at 
how the, the, the United States is collecting race and ethnicity data, and a very dangerous proposal that I'm going to talk to you about, which is going to conflate race and ethnicity. And then the last one is about an HSI community of practice around intersectionality for student success in STEM. And actually, I'm going to run to one of the adjunct uh, rooms right afterwards because we're starting our um, community of practice with office hours. You could just drop in and tell us this is what we're going through. How could we mentor our students? How could we provide more support for our students, et cetera, et cetera. The, I always start off every meeting I have talking about what are our core values, right? Do no harm, intersectional solidarity, and so on and so on. So I ask you to think about how those are always going to be front and center with everything that we do. So what's our goal? I mentioned already, I'm going to focus a lot on data, but it's also about, you know, beyond that praxis and invite you to think about what one or two things you can do. So I want you to also think about this question. You know a little bit about me. Think back to when you were 16. What was your race, gender, ethnicity, and parent level of education, parent one, parent two, whether it was in the United States or not? And how does that compare to your social location right now? So a lot of people use the word identity, and I think it's an important construct, but I also want you to think about your social location in grids of power, right? It's important to know the narratives, the stories about our families and, and how we describe our identity. And it's also important to think about our values, our ethical commitments. None of these domains of belonging are concordant. They can be analytically distinct and I'll talk more about that later. So what is intersectionality? It's a new vision. It's a new lens on understanding inequality and complexity. If we, we are using the word intersectionality and we don't include the word power in it, then we're not doing intersectionality, right? If we don't talk about history, place, if we don't talk about um, this commitment to self-criticism, right? I am one of two dark-skinned women tenured in my department. And, and also even in the, in the college that started as assistant professor, um, one of them is already gone, Native American woman. But I recognize that in how colorism works. As a black Latina, I'm not among the darkest skin, right? So how does that self-criticism or self-reflection help us to understand how anti-blackness might be, um, it, how colorism is implicated? Okay, so this is a very basic definition. It comes from um, Patricia Hill Collins and Sirma Bilge. Intersectionality interrogates power relations, again, no intersectionality is happening unless you're looking at power <laughs> and looking at individuals' experiences in everyday life as an analytic tool, and that's a typo there, sorry about that. Uh, intersectionality views categories of race, class, gender, sexuality, nation, ability, ethnicity, et cetera, as interrelated and mutually constructed as simultaneous. So that's a very important nugget. They're not the same thing, like race is not class, is not ethnicity, is not sexuality, is not disability. These are different things that require different questions, but they're simultaneous, right? And it's a way of understanding complexity. It's a tool for action. So intersectionality requires action, right? I'm not sure why this is not advancing. Maybe the battery died. Okay, so this is, it comes from Patricia Hill Collins's work. Uh, intersectionality as critical social theory. And she says, these are the core concepts. So if we're going to talk about intersectionality, we need to engage all of that play space. We have to recognize that it's not either, is it class or is it gender? It's both and, right? And we also have to think about the differences, like I said, between social location, narrative of identity. And we also have to foster this sense of we're all connected, right? Locally, globally, regionally and that we can foster what Patricia Hill Collins calls flexible solidarity, recognizing who we are, shifting, and being compassionate about those that are different from us, right? All right, so this is this definition of um, flexible solidarity. It's a praxis, right? It's action. It's not just words, right? Working towards unity and struggle for justice, creating coalitions, across difference, right? To center justice and liberation. Other uh, intersectional scholars who've written about this, Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term, I'm sure you, you know that. 
but others include Hancock. She talks about deep political intersectionality, Yuval Davis, who also talks about transversal politics. Okay, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> sorry about this. So here's just a little list. I'm not gonna go into all of it, but there's a long history be beyond the word being coined. Um, this is a response I got from a program officer when I asked about funding at a prestigious federal agency over a decade ago, and this is what he said to me, it's analytical laziness. I better just focus on race, gender, or class, and guess what? What about poor white people? And I'm thinking, has this program officer ever read anything by intersectional scholars who are talking about liberation for everyone and that we have to understand the experiences of everyone in a, in a very unique way? Anyway, um, this is a quote from the Columbia River Collective that does that, that talks about how they, and this was black women in the 70s who said, we, are, we care about everyone. If there's a struggle of injustice, we are interested in making sure that we are in solidarity with them. Okay, so now I'm gonna share with you some of the research that I've done with co-conspirators who have had access to data that I may not have access to unless they were part of this uh, co-conspiring to understand who we're serving in an HSI. So this quote comes from Covarrubias who coined or really engaged in, in quantitative intersectionality. And he says to capture the nuances of our lives at the intersection of these oppressions, we experience these relationships through the simultaneity of our uh, political and social identities as mediated by external conditions and contexts. Um, uh, Boleg also talks about how we have to analyze research findings within a macro socio-historical context. A lot of times decontextualized data leads to what um, Zuberi calls racial thinking, right? So if we're thinking that someone's race causes an outcome, that's racial thinking. We're not placing it in context. What is it about the treatment people receive based on how they're racialized that might be shaping unequal educational opportunities? So the interpretation of the researcher really matters, right? Um, I'm not sure why it's kind of not advancing. I'm trying. Okay, this is a tool that I urge all of you to engage. It comes from Patricia Hill Collins. It's called the Matrix of Domination. And what this does is allow us to diagnose what's happening here in Nuevo Mexico, or the Dominican Republic, or my family's from, or Brazil, or maybe if we go to Germany. We have to understand that there's a particular history of capitalism there, right? Of heteropatriarchy, of settler colonialism, of... Uh, all these systems of oppression that have a unique history, right? The history of the Dominican Republic is not the history of Haiti, which is the same island, right? It's different. So we have to understand that particular arrangement and that history. But then we have to dig deeper. We have to understand the way power is arranged in our organizations, in our rules of the game, in the way people experience that power at the micro level, at the individual level, and how that affects their consciousness. And then this outer layer is what Patricia Hill Collins calls the cultural or hegemonic domain of power. What are the stories we tell? What This is the ideological glue. So an example would be, I don't know if this has happened at your institution, but at my institution, there was an attempt to raise the GPA or SAT score, ACT, for who has access to the lottery scholarship. And the narrative was, well, you don't want these kids to fail. And, et cetera, et cetera. So who is considered, you know, these narratives have consequences for the rules of the game and the ways in which we distribute resources, right? So a counter narrative would be exclusion masquerading as excellence, right? And that's actually what happened. Students organized, <laughs> many of them were, um, you know, parents, veterans, you name it, saying, if these rules go into effect, I will not have access to higher ed, right? Uh, this is another tool that comes from an intersectional scholar that talks about multi-level analysis, power, self-reflexivity, time and space, diverse knowledge, social justice, equity, and so on. Um, okay, so here is an article that I published in Race, Ethnicity, and Education with two of our students who um, helped us look at making the invisible visible. And the question we asked, and here I say, don't wait for the money. This again was not funded, but we still did it. So a lot of times institutions are like, 
we're only going to analyze data for compliance. Can't we do better than that? Can't we analyze data that helps us better serve our students, right? There's nothing in compliance that says we can't do this. But as far as we know, we are the first empirical study that has employed intersectionality to look at odds of graduation in the in the country, and I would say beyond the country. So what do we do? We looked at nine years of first time, first year um, uh, students, undergraduates. Our analytical sample was over 6,000 students. They had to have graduated from a high school in the state. I can't name the name of the university because of IRB rules, but you can imagine, right? Why did we do that? Because we understand that the experiences may be very different for people who grew up here. Um, this is just reminding us that quantitative methods need to engage intersectionality and that we have to look at how all of these social locations are related to each other. So we created 20 of them. We considered within group difference, so among Latinos, among Native Americans, among white students, and also across. And so here's our results. These are not graduation rates. These are odds of graduating, probabilities, right? So all of the social locations in red are low income. And our funding formula to date assumes that Pell status as a proxy for low income is addressing achievement gaps. It isn't, okay? So I want you to think back to when you were 16, where would you be located? Because all Latinos are lumped as of though we all occupy the same race when we know anyone in this room could be Latino or Asian or native, but based on what we look like, I call it street race. We may experience something very different when it comes to um, access to opportunity. I would have been in here. So what we're saying is if our reference group is white, high-income women, Hispanic, low-income women, and that was me, right, are 23% less likely to graduate. If you are a white woman, 14% less likely, right? And for Asian women, it was the same, pretty similar. Look at indigenous. We could use a deficit framework and say, well, this just means that we should use this data to exclude Native Americans, right? Just because you do an intersectional analysis doesn't mean that you are paying attention to history, context, and the influences of structural discrimination, settler colonialism, et cetera. It's the lens that you use. I could use this data for liberation, or I could use this data for exclusion. I just want you to keep that in mind because some people might turn around and say, well, let's just admit, we know that these folks are graduating pretty, you know, it's pretty good. Let's just get rid of these folks. So this is what I'm trying to tell you. An intersectional lens makes the invisible visible because it shows you inequities that if we're just reporting race alone, gender alone, class alone, we wouldn't see any of that. All right. Um, here's, this is not odds of graduating. These are five-year graduation rates. And in this case, I am allowed to say <laughs> that it was UNM. Again, look at all the women. These are all low-income women. First-generation college means, like me, you grew up in a household when you were 16. No one had a four-year college degree. Continuing generation, one parent had a college degree. So you see disparities, Black and Native, only a quarter graduating, right? Latinos falling a little bit higher, but again, this is not disaggregated by race, so we don't really know what's happening there. White women and then uh, in, uh, Asian women. What institution do you know of that does this for high school graduation, that does this for college two-year or four-year graduation, or who gets degrees in STEM? We don't do it. Oh, it's not complex, you know. We, the government doesn't ask us to do that. It's, it's not something that we're required to do. We have to do better. We have an ethical responsibility to do better and to create equity lifts for all of these folk, right? It's not the case that we're going to say, oh, well, you know, um, it looks like 60% of continuing generation Black men are fine. You know, that's, that's, that's cool. The other statistic that I didn't show you, and I'll go back just so that you can see the power of intersectionality, <laughs> Black high-income men and low-income white men have the same odds of graduating, and they're horrific. And, and an intersectional question would be, well, what's more important? Is it race or is it class? 
That's the wrong question. How is it that the, the experiences of black high income men might be radically different and to create an equity lift there may look very different for high income white males. Very, very different. The other thing is most white uh, undergraduates at this institution that shall remain nameless are not first gen. <laughs> and half of the Latinos are, two thirds of the Native Americans are, and, and about half of uh, African American. And for Asians, it's also, you know, um, it's very different. So we have to understand who we're serving. Without intersectionality, we don't even know who's in our, in our university, we don't. Um, look at this result comparing pre-COVID, past co um, and post-COVID, who came back. For uh, Native American women who were continuing generation, about 81% came back. But if they were first gen, only 56%. The question then becomes, are they graduating, right? All right, so this is like a policy analysis saying this is a status quo using Pell as a proxy for like achievement gaps. It doesn't work, folks. There are alternatives, and the alternative that I want you to think of is the bottom one that says, we have an ethical commitment to identify intersectional equity gaps that consider race, gender, ethnicity, parent level of education as analytically distinct and simultaneous. Our equity metrics and communication have to embrace this complexity. Um, you know, to do any less would mean that we're being complicit with not serving all of our students, right? <laughs> all right, I know this is very popular now that we've had this um, ruling from the Supreme Court saying that race sensitive affirmative action has to be outlawed and so on. They're like, well, we're just gonna use zip code or we're just gonna use a high school they want to. No, <laughs> zip code is not a proxy for class. I grew up here in public housing in New York City in the 1970s, across the street, co-ops that were sued when I was in high school for discriminating against visible minorities, right? This is asset building, this is not asset building. You come to Albuquerque, you see the same thing. Across the street, you see a $700,000 house and a trailer park. People who work cleaning the floors at Walmart and executives and you know engineers and professors and so on with six figures. Zip code is not a proxy, so that we have to be very careful with that. This is an essay that I've shared with many of my colegas who are like, what do we do? You know, we can't consider race. I said, well, students are still able to talk about how their individual character and experiences, and I would say intersectional experiences with self-identified race, perceived race, culture, uh, growing up in a family where no parent, all of that, they can talk about it in an essay, so they can still do that. I just want to share that nugget with you. Um, all right, so what are some other opportunities here that at Santa Fe Community College you can embrace? We created a race and social justice certificate for classes, different disciplines that undergraduates can take at the graduate level. It's five, it's open to community. We didn't have to create any new classes, they already existed. We just created the opportunity to have it transcripted. Um, we also established almost 10 years ago the U.S. and Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, I invite you all to visit diverse.unm.edu, click Jedi Education, you'll see our checklist. Syllabi have to address three out of four learning outcomes that engage history, power, critical reflexivity, and so on and so on. So the only people who are qualified to review those syllabi have to have published or done uh, teaching in those learning outcomes. It's a rigorous review. So not everything will count. We make sure that most of those classes, many of them are in the gen ed. So it's not an extra credit. Students can still fulfill it. So considering that, we created in 2014 a preferred criteria for all job ads through the diversity council and the provost endorsed it. Demonstrated commitment to equity and inclusion and student success and working with broadly diverse communities. And you can show that in multiple ways. Uh, VP Asata Sarai, who joined our community about three and a half years ago, has done a microaggression survey. I hope you get a chance to invite her to share those results. We found out not only black students, but also students who have identified with having a disability experience horrific things on campus. Nobody knows what's going on. So how do we make sure that the people that we hire understand what equity means in an intersectional way, right? 
Um, we also created a dedicated class on intersectionality. I teach that. Um, race, class, gender for social policy. It enrolls both undergrads and grads in the same room, 40 of each, I'm sorry, 40 total, 20 of each, uh, and make it available in multiple modalities, uh, you know, online, in person, et cetera. We have a research practice partnership on ethnic studies. We also, I um, collaborated with elected officials to introduce a bill this year so that we would be the first state in the country to collect parent level of education from preschool to grad school. People will say, well, we collect that in the FAFSA. Well, not all our kids fill out the FAFSA. We need it for every single student that walks through our doors so that we know who we're serving, right? And then um, what I'm gonna run to in a few minutes is an NSF grant that I just recently got in partnership with CNM and also NMSU. It's $3 million for five years with CUNY which is my alma mater, on creating a community of practice around intersectionality for serving our students, particularly in the STEM fields. Um, here's a lecture series that we had last year and we're gonna continue. The website for any of you who wanna join our community of practice, it's open to anyone. You know, We targeted those schools, but it is open to anyone. You visit hsistemintersectionality.com and you will find you know, the Zoom links to join our office hours and our upcoming talks. But I wanted to highlight these two because these colleagues, sociologists, both of whom are Latino, right, have done studies that show why we need to do intersectional analysis. 80,000 students in this data set, University of California, and guess what they found out? Uh, Alvero, the first speaker, that when <clears throat> uh, schools are qualifying for HSI status, they don't ask the intersectional question. Well, it turns out the most elite UC school, University of California schools are qualifying based on very high income and mostly white Latinos who are of European background. And then the second tier schools, that's where most of the low income Latino kids are going. So again, an intersectional analysis makes the invisible visible. And um, Dr. Rizari, who is uh, co-PI with me on a project with the OMB and the census, finds that when you look at STEM, Latino and black kids who have the same AP scores, who have earned you know, the same credits, somehow they drop out of STEM. It, and, and the argument is always, well, they don't have the skills. They, they, what is happening in those classrooms? What is that climate like for them? And if we even ask the other question, what is it like for a first gen black Latina woman or a first gen brown skin Chicana woman who's not, not black? What is that environment like, et cetera? So we need to find out what is going on. So her study um, shows that pattern on a national level, right? So if we're not intersectional, e even if we have good intentions, we are not serving everyone. All right. Um, how much time do I have? Because this could take another 40 minutes, this next section. Five minutes. Okay, so I'm going to be very selective. <laughs> I'm going to be very selective, and I will race through this. And when I have one minute, please raise your hand so that we can have a little Q&A, or we will not have time. A little Q&A. Okay. So I want to ask, what is your theory of reality, your ontology about what race is, what ethnicity is, what ancestry is, what origin is? Are they all the same thing? Are they analytically distinct? And I'm going to make the argument that street level race, and this is, I'm talking, I'm talking about how others see you, like gender is a master social status. It's, it's one of the first things that people notice about you. So there's a saying in Spanish, I'm sure you've heard it, no se puede tapar el sol con un dedo. You can't cover the sun with a finger, right? Race and ethnicity, they're both social constructions. There's no genetic basis for any of them. Um, they are not innate. They're not equivalent and they're not concordant. Ethnicity is a social position in society that refers to your cultural heritage. Race is a social position that has a visual, ocular, and corporeal dimension. And my good friend, uh, Howard Hogan, who's co-authored uh, an article with me, makes it plain. If you don't know what you're measuring, any question is going to do, right? So the, the Office of Man Management and Budget tells the entire country, including the census, how to collect race data. And for many years has made the case, Hispanic ethnicity or ethnicity is not analytically equivalent to race. But now all of a sudden, 
we are going to conflate those two things. And guess what was the second largest in the census? Because they did just that. They did a precursor to it. They're going to do more, but two or more. Is two or more a civil rights enforced category? And how many combinations would you get when you're asking about two things? Would we ask about gender and sexuality in one question or income or parent level of education in one question? It leads to garbage in, garbage out. And it's really troubling. So much so that I co-authored uh, a report on Black Latinidad that had to use 2019 data because of what happened with the 2020 data. It was unusable. So, you know, uh, the inequities we found disappeared, right? Um, an intersectional lens acknowledges that Latinos are complicated, as are any other groups, right? By national origin, citizenship, race, class, ethnicity, et cetera. And that it, it should not be used as a term to homogenize, but as a term of implicit solidarity. My husband and I co-curated a show to kind of ask artists to say, how does, you know, how, what's your street race? How do lived experiences and relationships of power shape what you think of as identity, right? I did this piece in the conversation.com. It has, I don't know, like 70,000 readers that talked about the Census Bureau keeps confusing race and ethnicity. I've published articles in race, ethnicity, and education, critical public health showing the inequities that become visible when you include more than one measure of race, not just how you identify, but how do others see you? What's your street race? And I ask myself, should Latinos, all of whom could be Mexican, Dominican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Honduran, whatever, all mark the same box for race? Or would that actually lead to impeding the plentiful evidence that shows that based on what you look like, you are treated differently. This is just a quote saying, this is not something new. I mean, the enslavement of Africans, 90% of us were shipped to Latin America, right? Uh, this is not anything new. There has been racial hierarchies in Latin America. So I'm not gonna read the quote. It's also historical amnesia. This case that I'm sure you're all familiar with involved a young woman, a, a little girl who was being denied access to uh, school because she's visibly brown. Meanwhile, her cousins were told, and um, let's be clear, it's not the little boy in the middle, but the two girls that they could enroll. So Latinos have never been treated as a racial monolith, but all of a sudden we're going to pretend that that's true. Is that to say that these, uh, that if you're a light-skinned Latino, you're not Latino, or if you're, if you look different? No, it's re recognizing cultural heritage is not the same thing as race, right? And it's very interesting because that many of the ethnic studies teachers that we have uh, talked to tell us that their dark skin, brown skin, Latino students are telling them that people are yelling at them, go back to your country, and even trying to run over them with their trucks. That's what they're dealing with right now, okay? All right, that's my alarm saying I gotta end. <laughs> so I'll just tell you a quick preview. The research that I'm doing in the National Archives right now is uncovering that was not always the case in the 90s and the 70s. There was a attempt saying, how come there has never been a brown category in the racial uh, designation boxes? If Hispanics want to report brown in the race question, let them do it. Um, precede the race question and the Hispanic origin question with a general clarifying instruction. It's true people are confused about what we're asking, but why can't we clarify what we're asking and what the use is, right? Uh, last thing, <laughs> this was a visual I wanted to show, and it was basically making that point that your social location is not the same as your, um, your narrative of identity, your ethical and political commitments, um, all the data that shows why we need to disaggregate that Latinos, if you ask the question brown, 20% will say, yes, they are brown. This was like the first empirical study that actually included that as a study uh, that I co-authored. This is a study that I was referring to on Black Latinos, that if one of the paradoxes is Black Latinos actually have more education, higher poverty rates, lower home ownership, and women, Black Latina women have higher labor force participation than Black women who are not Latina, and then Latinas who are not Black and still experiencing massive, like none of that could be done. All right, I will end there.
because I know that you might have a question. <laughs> Thank you. Question. What one or two things can you do? That's what I'm interested in <laughs> with this information, but go ahead. Por favor, and if you could identify yourself. I'm Ondine Frauenglass. I'm the director of the Innovation Center at Santa Fe Community College, and we're invested in sustainable technologies. Um, I look at data a lot. I see the data, and I'm wondering uh, what the recommendations are from pivoting with data to create the kind of atmosphere that we want to live here at the college. So one of the main things is to understand that we need to know who we're serving. So I think I made that very clear. Are we collecting parent level of education, not just for our fast food filers, but for every single student to see who's walking in our door and who's actually leaving with what degree? And what are their post-secondary outcomes? So once they leave us, what happens to them? So unless we're reporting by that intersectional social location, and I'm gonna say the temptation is to say income, no. I'd rather have parent level of education. We're never going to get income from every student. That's just going to be impossible. And it's also a poor proxy because you can have a low income, but have like a trust fund. <laughs> I mean, you could you could have wealth that's hidden and that happens. But parent level of education is a pretty good measure that we could probably get from every single student. And so, sure, we're going to comply. You know, like the federal government tells us we only want, you know, by one axis at a time. That's cool. But we got to do better. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. yeah. If you see me run away, it's because I have to start the Zoom for our community of practice. This is a question from our online participants. Um, how do you, Dr. Lopez, uh, recommend convincing leadership to examine intersectional data rather than compliance? I think that we tie it to our institutional values. We say we want to serve all our students. We say that we want to make sure that we are serving our communities. And without having that intersectional question of accountability, we're not living up to our values. So it's very hard to... Um, make it any more plain that business as usual is not working. We got to do something different. And yeah, you know, like the, the federal government says we have to, you know, compile or um, aggregate all Latinos by race, et cetera. We got to do whatever compliance says, but we got to do more. To do any less, I think for me would be unethical. And I'll just tell you that this year I've served on 85 PhD NMA committees in 22 years. And this year, five of my students finished their degrees in sociology, all of them BIPOC, one Asian American woman, uh, four Latinos, two of whom were black Latinos like myself, two Chicanos. They all have jobs in academia, tenure track in different states, different departments and so on. And that we wouldn't even know. And they're all first, uh, the Latinos are first generation college. That we would never have had that if we didn't insist on collecting that data because we didn't know and I can tell you, I've been there 22 years. That's a first. That's a first. So um, without intersectional analysis and accountability, we are not doing what we say we're preaching. So much. So a closing remark as we go to lunch, um, hopefully you're starting to see that we're building the DEIAB. So our morning really was about the DEI and the afternoon is about the AB plus. Um, and so we're gonna go to lunch.